The early universe was supposed to be dark and simple, filled with neutral hydrogen, maybe lit by the very first stars, but certainly not galaxies. Yet, JWST may have found them anyway, deep in the era cosmologists call the Dark Ages. If these candidates are real, they don't just stretch the Big Bang model, they break it. Because galaxies this early simply shouldn't exist. And yet, here they are. So what does it mean for our understanding of the universe itself? For decades, Hubble pushed the frontier of the observable universe, inch by inch. First a redshift of six, then eight, and finally 11, galaxies just 400 million years after the Big Bang. Each step took years of deeper exposures, analysis, and debate. Then came the JWST. Within its first few surveys, it leapt to a redshift of 14. And now, just a couple of years later, we're talking about candidates at a redshift of 25, more than doubling Hubble's record in the blink of an eye. The question is, why so fast? In the Big Bang model, galaxies should grow rarer and harder to see as we look further back. The early universe was meant to be sparse, its galaxies dim and difficult to detect. But JWST is finding the opposite. In tiny patches of sky, the deeper we look, the more galaxies appear. Bright, compact and abundant. If the Big Bang timeline is right, they shouldn't be there at all. This was supposed to be the universe's dark ages, a stretch of history when it was neutral, empty, long before galaxies could take shape. And yet, we keep finding them. Why so many and why so soon? The answer lies in what JWST has actually seen. In a single web deep survey, astronomers have identified not one, but three candidate galaxies at extreme redshifts. One lies at 25.4, another at 26, and a third closer to 25. Which means we're seeing them just 120 to 110 million years after the Big Bang. Both are astonishingly bright for their time, with UV magnitudes around minus 18 to minus 19, comparable to much later dwarf galaxies, but appearing barely 100 million years after the Big Bang. And both are tiny, with half-light radii below 100 parsecs. That's barely larger than a giant star-forming clump inside the Milky Way. The researchers, however, stress caution. These are photometric redshifts, estimated from broadband colours and the Lyman break. They could, in principle, be dusty galaxies at a much lower redshift, or extreme emission line interlopers. But the fit strongly favours the high redshift solution. And if they are real, they don't just stretch the timeline, they blow it apart. So why does this matter? Because it puts us in direct conflict with the Big Bang timeline. The confirmed galaxy MOMZ14, at a redshift of 14.3, was already pressed against the edge of reionization. According to the Lambda CDM, the very first stars may have ignited by a redshift of 20 or 30. But building entire galaxies with billions of stars, heavy elements and compact structures was supposed to take much longer. So, when we push further to a redshift of 25, we're not just talking about the appearance of the first stars, we're talking about fully-fledged galaxies appearing in a universe that should be dark, neutral and almost entirely empty. In the Big Bang framework, the galaxies simply shouldn't exist in the Dark Ages. And yet, these objects don't just exist, they're extreme, too bright for their age, too compact for their size and far too early for the models to handle. To fit them in, you'd have to compress hundreds of millions of years of cosmic evolution into just a hundred million. It's not a tweak, it's a timeline crisis. And there's another problem. When MOMZ14 was confirmed at a redshift of 14, even a single detection in such a small patch of sky implied galaxies were around a thousand times more common than the models predict. Now, we have not one, but three candidates even deeper into the Dark Ages. But by the same logic, their abundance should have been even higher. Too bright, too small, too early, and now, simply too many. So how do astronomers actually decide that these galaxies are at a redshift of 25? The key tool astronomers use at these redshifts is the Lyman break. 
Neutral hydrogen blocks all light bluer than 1260 angstroms, carving out a sharp cutoff in the galaxy spectrum. The cutoff shifts redward with distance, so finding it tells us the galaxy's redshift. It's the cosmic barcode we can scan to measure distance and time. The gold standard is spectroscopy. Spread a galaxy's light into a spectrum and you see not just the break itself, but all the fine structure around it. The forest of absorption lines, the damping wings, the gradual ramp from neutral to ionized gas. That's how MOMZ14 was nailed down at a redshift of 14.4. In principle, spectroscopy lets us watch reionization unfold. But beyond redshift 20, spectroscopy fails. The galaxies are simply too faint. Spread their light out and it disappears into noise. So astronomers fall back on photometry. Instead of a spectrum, Webb takes deep images through broad filters. If a galaxy vanishes in one filter but appears in the next, that dropout marks the Lyman break. It's quick, powerful, and it's how the Redshift 25 candidates were found. Here's the catch. Photometry can't show us the shape of the break. It compares the spectrum into broad bands, then matches the dropout against model templates. And those templates already assume what they're supposed to be testing that the early universe was filled with neutral hydrogen, producing a sharp universal break. But if the IGM were more ionized, or if absorption varied strongly along different sight lines, photometry wouldn't see it. It would still return a best fit redshift based on the assumed template. That's why spectroscopy is essential. Only a spectrum can reveal the true shape of the break, the damping wings, the gradual recovery, the fingerprint of reionization itself. And that's what makes it the first great test. In plasma or tired light cosmologies, there is no global reionization war. Ionization is local, not universal. The break wouldn't evolve systematically with distance. So the question is simple. Does the shape of the break change with redshift or not? And there's a second test hiding in the same data. Every telescope, no matter how powerful, eventually runs into the same wall. The background noise of the universe itself. But the position of that wall depends on the model. In the Big Bang framework, surface brightness fades with 1 plus z to the power of 4. So by redshift 30 to 50, galaxies should already be too faint to see. In tired light models, that dimming penalty doesn't exist. The wall lies much further out, limited only by noise. So the deeper we can push, the sharper the question becomes. Do galaxies vanish where the Big Bang says they must? or do we keep finding them further and further back? Right now, Webb can't tell us, but the next generation of 30 to 40 meter telescopes, or with a bigger infrared observatory in space, we could resolve the structures of the break. And at the same time, discover just how far back galaxies truly go before they hit the ultimate wall of noise. Faced with galaxies this early, cosmologists have to find a way to preserve the timeline. And sure enough, both groups reach for different fixes. But like so many times before, these fixes look less like explanations and more like patches. The first study reports six candidates around a redshift of 17 and three more at 25. From those numbers, they calculate how the ultraviolet density evolves with redshift. In the Big Bang framework, it should fall away steeply. Instead, it declines much more slowly. To explain that, Galaxies in the early universe would have to convert their gas into stars with impossible efficiency. 25% at redshift 17 and a staggering 60% at 25. Think about what that means. 60% of all the gas in a young galaxy would have to collapse into stars almost instantly. Real galaxies don't do this. Feedback from the first supernovae should blow gas out. Cooling and fragmenting takes time. The physics of star formation simply doesn't allow it. To make these numbers work, you'd need some extraordinary intervention to redistribute gas and keep the starburst going. Without that, the efficiency figure is absurd. The second team solution is even stranger. They argue that the light we're seeing isn't from stars at all, but from primordial black holes, relics of the Big Bang itself, accreting gas and blazing like quasars. In their model, more than 90% of the ultraviolet light at these redshifts would be from primordial black holes. 
But this creates a whole new set of problems. The Big Bang model doesn't naturally make enough primordial black holes to begin with. The abundance required here would overwhelm the universe's matter budget. And if so many existed, what became of them? They can't all merge quietly into galactic centres. Collisions of primordial black holes would flood the cosmos with gravitational waves and radiation. We don't see that. Either way, the message is clear. If these candidates are real, the Big Bang timeline has a problem. To make the data fit, you have to choose between galaxies that form stars with godlike efficiency or primordial black holes lighting up the dark ages. Both explanations amount to patching over a much deeper issue that galaxies this early simply shouldn't exist in the Big Bang model. So where does that leave us? The Webb telescope is showing us galaxies that, if real, don't just stretch the Big Bang timeline, they tear it apart. Astronomers desperate to patch the Big Bang have reached for two radical fixes. The first, galaxies somehow converting over 60% of their gas into stars in almost an instant. The other? Well, an early universe filled with primordial black holes we can't see. Either way, the cures stretch credibility as much as the problem. And that's ignoring that Webb is already pushing against the noise wall where galaxies should vanish into the Big Bang model. The timeline isn't just squeezed, the physics itself is running out of headroom. Maybe the problem isn't the galaxies at all, but the framework we use to measure them. Those precise redshifts they don't come straight from images, they come from model templates that assume the very timeline they're supposed to test. In tired light models, redshift isn't a cosmic clock, so finding galaxies at 25 isn't a crisis. Plasma cosmology imagines a universe already ionized with local pockets of neutral gas. Again, no dark age wall to break. The clash here isn't just over what Webb sees, but how we choose to interpret it. The question now is simple. Do we keep patching the framework or accept that it may already be broken?